Star Wars from the Adventures of Luke Skywalker is the original title of the novelization of the 1977 film Star Wars, ghost written by Alan Dean Foster but credited to George Lu Lucas. It was first published on no November 12, 1976 by Ballantine Books, several months before the release of the film. In later years, it was republished under the title Star Wars A New Hope to reflect the retroactive edition of a subtitle, which happened in 1981. Although the book contains some differences from the film, it also includes references to Palpatine and his rise to power in the prologue, setting up the backstory for future films. Development. The book was written by Foster and based upon Lucas's screenplay for the first Star Wars film. On how he got the job, Foster said, my agent got a call from Lucas's lawyer at the time, Tom Pollock, now one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. Someone had read a book of mine, Ice Rigger, and knew that I already had done some novelizations and thought I might be the writer to do the novelization of Lucas's new film. I already knew his work through THX 1138 and American Graffiti. I accepted the offer to meet with George and did so at Industrial Light and Magic, then in a small warehouse in Van Nuys, California. We hit it off well. I got the assignment for two books, and that's how it happened. Foster not only adapted the film's events, but also fleshed out the backstory of time, place, physics, planets, races, languages, history, and technology. When asked whether it was difficult for him to see Lucas get all the credit for the novelization, Foster said, not at all. It was George's story idea. It was merely expanding upon, I was merely expanding upon it. Not having my name on the cover didn't bother me in the least. It would be akin to a contractor demanding to have his name on a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Lucas, for his part, has been open about the fact that Foster go wrote, ghost wrote the novel, noting this fact in his introduction to later editions of the book, Publishing History. The paperback book was first published in the U.S. as Star Wars from the, Aven from the Adventures of Luke Skywalker in December of 1976 by Ballantine Books, six months before the theatrical film was released. The cover art was by Star Wars conceptual artist Ralph McQuarrie, who was commissioned by Ballantine Books executive Judy Lynn Del Rey, while he was working on visualization for Lucas's forthcoming film. The cover depicts Luke Skywalker carrying a lightsaber, Chewbacca, C-3PO, and R2-D2 standing in front of an enlarged head of Darth Vader. On the back of the book was written, soon to be a spectacular motion picture from 20th Century Fox. In the United Kingdom, the novelization was published by Sphere Books and featured covered art by, cover art by John Berkeley. Uh, by February of 1977, still three months before the film was released, the novelization sold out its initial print run of 125,000 copies. In the next three months, Ballantine sold three and a half million copies. Some later editions contain 16 pages of full color photos from the motion picture. Mine does not have those. Later editions of the novelization were published under altered titles to reflect the re retitling of the film, such as Star Wars A New Hope and Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope. And then it gets into differences from the film, but we're not going to get into that because I'm going to read the book, so you'll hear the differences from the film. All right. My copy of it is uh, was originally uh, printed, I believe it says copyright 1993. Uh, this is a reprint from, must be the late 90s, because it has advertisements from Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, at the beginning, so I would say it's probably 98. I don't see a copyright date specifically for this edition of it. Uh, it has novelizations for Star Wars, as it's titled here, but also The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Am I going to read all three of them? I don't know. I've only committed myself to the first one, so we're going to see how this goes. And I think we're now getting to the part where I uh, got cut off the first time. I took a break to have a drink, and then I read to myself for like a half hour and didn't realize it. Uh, well, I guess I read to you over there on Instagram. Sorry about that. Uh, I keep focusing on Facebook because the mic that I'm talking into is being fed into Facebook. Whereas on Instagram, you're just hearing my, my phone. All right. One more sip of liquid courage, and then we're going to get into Star Wars from the adventures of Luke Skywalker. Also, I have my uh, producers on standby, so uh, if uh, we do encounter any technical difficulties early on, uh, we will uh, address those hopefully quicker. Um, also, I'm going to put the put my background music back on again. Uh, for those of you paying attention, it is we're going uh, public domain. Uh, you know, avoid those copyright hits unless Disney gets me for uh, reading out of Star Wars. But Symphonic Treasures. This is uh, album number one. Twenty three great themes from great music. So here we go.
Prologue. Let's do this. Another galaxy, another time. The Old Republic was the Republic of Legend. Greater than distance or time. No need to know where it was or from whence it came, only to know that it was the Republic. Once under the wise rule of the Senate and the protection of the Jedi Knights, the Republic throve and grew. But as often happens, when wealth and power pass beyond the admirable and attain the awesome, then appear those evil ones who have greed to match. So it was with the Republic at its height. Like the greatest of trees, able to withstand any external attack, the Republic rotted from within, though the danger was not visible from the outside. Aided and abetted by restless, power-hungry individuals within the government and the massive organs of commerce, the ambitious Senator Palpatine caused himself to be ejected, elected the President of the Republic. He promised to reunite the disaffected among the people and to restore the remembered glory of the Republic. Once secure in the office, he declared himself Emperor, shutting himself away from the populace. Soon he was controlled by the very assistants and bootlickers he had appointed to high office, and the cries of the people for justice did not reach his ears. Having exterminated through treachery and deception the Jedi Knights, guardians of justice in the galaxy, the Imperial governors and bureaucrats prepared to institute a reign of terror among the, the disheartened worlds of the galaxy. Many used the Imperial forces in the name of the increasingly isolated Emperor to further their own personal ambitions, but a small number of systems rebelled at these new outrages. Declaring themselves opposed to the new order, they began the great battle to restore the old republic. From the beginning, they were vastly outnumbered by the systems held in thrall by the emperor. In those first dark days, it seemed certain the bright flame of resistance would be extinguished before it could cast the light of new truth across the galaxy of oppressed and beaten people. From the first saga, Journey of the Wills, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Naturally, they became heroes, Leia Organa. Senator of Alderaan, Chapter 1. It was a vast, shining globe, and it cast a light of lambent topaz into space. But it was not a sun. Thus, the planet had fooled men for a long time. Not until entering close orbit around it did its discoverers realize that this was a world in a binary system and not a third sun itself. At first, it seemed certain nothing could exist on such a planet, least of all humans, yet both massive G1 and G2 stars orbited a common center with peculiar regularity, and Tatooine circled them far enough out to permit the development of a rather stable, exquisitely hot climate. Mostly, this was a dry desert of a world, whose unusual star-like yellow glow was the result of double sunlight striking sodium-rich sands and flats. That same sunlight suddenly shone on the thin skin of a metallic shape, falling crazily toward the atmosphere. The erratic course the galactic cruiser was traveling was intentional, not the product of injury, but of desperate desire to avoid it. Long streaks of intense energy slid close past its hull. A multi-hued storm of destruction like a school of rainbow remoras fighting to attach themselves to a larger unwilling host. One of those probing, questing beams succeeded in touching the fleeing ship, striking its principal solar flare. Gem-like fra fragments of metal and plastic erupted into space. As the end of the fin disintegrated, the vessel seemed to shudder. The source of those multiple energy beams suddenly hove into view, a lumbering imperial cruiser its massive outline bristling cactus-like with dozens of heavy weapons emplacements. Light ceased arching from the, those spines now as the cruiser moved in. It moved in close. Intermittent explosions and flashes of light could be seen in those portions of the smaller ship which had taken hits. In the absolute cold of space, the cruiser snuggled up alongside its wounded prey. Another distant explosion shook the ship, but it certainly didn't feel distant to R2-D2 or C-3PO. The concussion bounced them around the narrow corridor like bearings in an old motor. 
To look at these two, one would have supposed that the tall human-like machine, 3PO, was the master, and the stubbly tripodal robot, R2-D2, an inferior. But while 3PO might have sniffled disdainfully at the suggestion, they were in fact equal in everything save loquacity. Here, 3PO clearly, and necessarily, the superior. Still, another explosion rattled the corridor, throwing 3PO off balance. His shorter companion had the better of it during such moments, with his squat, cylindrical body's low center of gravi gravity well, balanced on thick, clawed legs. R2 glanced up at 3PO, who was steadying himself against a corridor wall. Lights blinked enigmatically around a single, mechanic single mechanical eye as the smaller robot studied the battered casing of his friend. A patina of metal and fibrous dust coated the usually gleaming bronze finish, and there were some visible dents all the result of the pounding the rebel ship they were on had been taken. Accompanying the last attack was a persistent deep hum, which even the loudest explosion had not been able to drown out. Then, for no apparent reason, the basso thrumming abruptly ceased, and the only sounds in the otherwise deserted corridor came from the eerie, dry twig crackle, shorting relays, and the pops of dying circuitry. Explosions began to echo through the ship once more, but they were far away from the corridor. Threepio turned his smooth, human-like head to one side. Metallic ears listened intently. The imitation of a human pose was hardly necessary. Threepio's auditory sensors were fully omnidirectional, but the slim robot had been programmed to blend perfectly among human companies. This program programming extended even to mimicry of human gestures. Did, Did you, you hear that? that? He, he inquired, inquired rhetorically, rhetorically of his patient companion, referring to the throbbing sound. They've, They've shut, shut down, down the main, main reactor, reactor and the drive. drive. His voice was full of disbelief and concern as that of any human. One metallic palm rubbed dolefully at a patch of gray on his side where a broken hull brace had fallen and scored the bronze finish. 3PO was a fastidious machine and such things troubled him. Madness, this, this is, is madness. madness. He shook his head slowly. This, this time, time we'll be destroyed, destroyed for sure. R2 did not comment immediately. Beryl torso, torso tilted backward, powerful legs gripping the deck. The meter high robot was engrossed in, in studying the roof overhead. Though he did not have a head to cock in a listening position like his friend, R2 still somehow managed to convey that impression. A series of short beeps and chirps issued from his speaker. To even a sensitive human ear, they would have been just as much static. But to 3PO, they formed words as clear and pure as direct current. Yes, yes I, I suppose, suppose they, they did, did have to shut, shut down, down the drive, drive. 3PO admitted. But, but what, what are we, we going, going to do now? We, we can't, can't enter atmosphere with our main stabilizer fin destroyed. destroyed. I, can't I can't believe, believe we're simply we're going, going to surrender. surrender. A small band of armed humans suddenly appeared, rifles held at the ready. Their expressions were as worry-wrinkled as their uniforms and they carried about them the aura of men prepared to die. Threepio watched silently until they had vanished around a far bend in the passageway, then looked back at R2. The smaller robot hadn't shifted from his position of listening. Threepio's gaze turned upward also, though he knew R2's senses were slightly sharper than his own. What, what is, is it, R2? R2? A short burst of beeping came in. Response, another moment, and there was no need for highly attuned sensors. For a minute or two more, the corridor remained deathly silent. Then a faint scrape, scrape, could be heard, like a cat at a door from somewhere above. That strange noise was produced by heavy footsteps in the movement of bulky equipment somewhere on the ship's hull. When several muffled explosions sounded, I just realized I didn't put any music on. Sorry. There we are. When several muffled explosions sounded, 3PO murmured, They've broken, They've broken in somewhere, somewhere above us. us. There's, There's no, no escape, escape for the captain, captain this time. time. Turning, he peered down at R2. I, I think, think we, we better... better... The shriek of overstressed metal filled the air before he could finish, and the far end of the passageway was lit by a blinding acetonic flash. Somewhere down there, the little cr cluster of armed crew who had passed by minutes before had encountered the ship's attackers. 3PO turned his face and delicate photoreceptors away, just in time to avoid the fragments of metal that flew down the corridor. At the far end, a gaping hole appeared in the roof, and reflective forms like big metal beads began dropping to the corridor floor. Both robots knew that no machine could match the fluidity with which these shapes moved and instantly assumed fighting positions. 
The new arrivals were human in armor, not mechanicals. One of them looked straight at 3PO. No, not at him. Panicked robot, the panicked robot thought frantically, but past him. The figure shifted its big r rifle around in armored hands. Too late. A beam of intense light struck the head, sending pieces of armor, bone, and flesh flying in all directions. Half the invading Imperial troops turned and began returning fire up the corridor, aiming past the two robots. Quick! Quick. This, this way, way, Ripio ordered. Intending to retreat from the Imperials, R2 turned with him. They had taken only a couple of steps when they saw the rebel crewmen in position ahead, firing down the corridor. In seconds, the passageway was filled with smoke and crisscrossing beams of energy. Red, green, and blue bolts ricocheted off polished sections of wall and floor or ripped long gashes in metal surfaces. Screams of injured and dying humans, a peculiar, peculiarly unrobotic sound, 3PO thought, echoed piercingly above the inorganic destruction. One beam struck near the robot's feet at the same time as a second one burst the wall directly behind him, exposing sparking, sparkling circuitry in rows of conduits. The force of the twin blast tumbled 3PO into the shredded cables, where a dozen different currents turned him into a jerking, twisting display. Strange sensations coursed through his metal nerve ends. They caused no pain, only confusion. Every time he moved and tried to free himself, there was another violent crackling as a fresh cluster of componentry broke. The noise and man-made lightning remained constant around him, and the battle continued to rage. Smoke began to fill the corridor. R2-D2 bustled about trying to help free his friend. The little robot evidenced a phlegmatic indifference to the ravening energies filling the passageway. He was built so low that most of the beams passed over him anyway. Help! 3PO yelled, suddenly frightened. A new message from an interior internal sensor. I, I think, think something, something is, is melting. melting. Free, free my left, left leg. leg. The, the trouble's near the, the pelvic servo meter. meter. Typically, his tone turned abruptly from pleading to berating. This, this is all your fault, fault, he shouted angrily. I, I should, should have known, known better than to trust the logic of a half-sized thermal compulsory dehousing a sister. I don't, I don't know why you insisted we leave our assigned stations to come down this stupid corridor. Not that it matters now. The whole ship must be. R2-D2 cut him off in mid-speech with some angry beeps and boops of his own, though he continued to cut and pull with precision at the tangled high voltage cables is that so 3po sneered in reply the same to you you little an exceptionally violent explosion shook the passage drowning him out a long searing miasma of carbonized component filled the air obscuring everything two meters tall bipedal flowing back robes trailing from the figure and a face forever masked by a functional if bizarre black metal breath screen a dark lord of the Sith was an awesome, threatening shape as it strode through the corridors of the rebel ship. Fear followed the footsteps of the all-dark lord. The cloud of evil which clung right about this peculiar one was intense enough to cause hardened Imperial troops to back away, menacing enough to set them muttering nervously among themselves. Once, resolute rebel crew members ceased resisting, broke and ran in a panic at the sight of the black armor. Armor which, though black as it was, was not nearly as dark as the thoughts drifting through the mind within. One purpose, one thought, one obsession dominated that mind now. It burned in the brain of, it burned in the brain of Darth Vader as he turned down another passageway in the broken fighter. There, smoke was beginning to clear, though the sounds of faraway fighting still resounded through the hall. The battle here had ended and moved on. Only a robot was left to stir freely in the wake of the Dark Lord's passing. C-3PO finally stepped clear of the last restraining cable. Somewhere behind him, human screams could be heard from where relentless Imperial troops were mopping up the last remnants of rebel resistance. 3PO glanced down and saw only scarred deck as he looked around. His voice was full of concern. R2-D2, where are you? The smoke seemed to part just a bit more. 3PO found himself staring up the passageway. R2-D2, it seemed, was there, but he wasn't looking in 3PO's direction. 
Instead, the little robot appeared frozen in, a in an attitude of attention. Leaning over him was... It was difficult even for 3PO's electronic photoreceptors to penetrate the clinging acidic smoke. A human figure. It was young, slim, and by human standards of, of aesthetics, 3PO mused of a calm beauty. One small hand seemed to be moving near that of R2's torso. 3PO started toward them as the haze thickened once more, but when he reached the end of the corridor, only R2 stood there waiting. 3PO peered past him, uncertain robots, uncertain. Robots were occasionally subject to electronic hallucinations, but why should he hallucinate a human? He shrugged. Then again, why not? Especially when one considered the confusing circumstances of the past hour and the dose of raw current he had recently absorbed. He shouldn't be surprised at anything his concentrated internal circuits conjoled up. Where, Where have, have you, you been? been? 3PO finally asked. Hiding, Hiding I, suppose. I suppose. He decided not to mention the maybe human. If it had been a hallucination, he wasn't going to give R2 the satisfaction of knowing how badly recent events had unsettled his logic circuits. They'll, They'll be, be coming, coming back, back this way. way. He went on, nodding down the corridor, and not giving the small automaton a chance to reply. Looking, Looking for, for human survivors. survivors. What, are what are we going, going to do now? They, they won't trust the word of a rebel-owned machine. machine. That, that we, we know, know for sure. sure. We'll be, be sent, sent to the spice, spice mines of Kessel, or, or taken, taken apart for spare, spare components for other, less deserving robots. That's, that's if they don't consider us a potential program trap and blow us apart on sight. If we don't... But... R2 had already turned and was ambling quickly back down the passageway. Wait, Wait where, where are you going? going? Haven't, Haven't you been, been listening, listening to me? Uttering curses in several languages, some purely mechanical, 3PO raced fluidly after his friend, the R2 unit, he thought to himself, could be downright closed-circuited when it wanted to. All right, how are we hanging in there? Good to know. Continuing on. Outside the Galactic Cruisers Control Center, the corridor was crowded with sullen prisoners gathered by Imperial troops. Some lay wounded, some dying. Several officers had been separated from the enlisted ranks and stood in a small group by themselves, bellowing belligerent looks and threats on the silence. Silent knot of troops holding on the bay. As if on command, everyone, Imperial troops as well as rebels, became silent as a massive caped form came into view from behind a turn in the passageway. Two of the heretofore resolute, obstinate rebel officers began to shake. Stopping before one of them, the towering figure, figure reached out wordlessly. A massive hand closed around the man's neck and lifted him off the deck. The rebel officer's eyes bulged, but he kept his silence. An Imperial officer, his armored helmet, shoved back to reveal a recent scar where an energy beam had penetrated his shielding, scrambled out, out of the fighter's control room, shaking his head blankly. Uh, nothing, sir. Information. Information retrieved system has been wiped clean. Darth Vader acknowledged this news with a barely perceptible nod. The impenetrable mask turned to regard the officer he was torturing. Metal-clad fingers contracted, reaching up. The prisoner desperately tried to pry them loose, but to no avail. Where is the data? Where is the data you intercepted? Vader rumbled <laughs> dangerously. What's what you've done? With the information tapes, we intercepted. We intercepted no information, the dangling officer gurgled. Barely able to breathe from somewhere deep within, he dredged up a squeal of outrage. This is a, a counter vessel. Did you not see our our exterior Martian markings? We're we're on a Diplomatic mission. Chaos, take, take your, your mission, mission, Vader growled. Where, Where are those, those tapes? tapes? He squeezed harder, the threat in his grip implicit. When he finally replied, the officer's voice was a bare, choked whisper. Only, only the commander knows. This ship carries the system crest of Alderaan, Vader growled, the gargoyle-like breath musk leaning close. Is, is any, any of the, the royal, royal family, family on board? Who are, are you carrying? Thick fingers tightened further, and the officer's struggles became more and more frantic. His last words were muffled and choked past intelligibility. Vader was not pleased. 
Even though the figure went limp with an awful, unquestionable finality, the hand continued to tighten, producing a chilling, snapping, and popping of bone, like a dog patting on plastic. Then, with a disgusted wheeze, Vader finally threw, do threw the doll from the, of the dead man against the wall. Several Imperial troops ducked out of the way, just in time to avoid the grisly missile. The massive form whirled unexpectedly, and Imperial officers shrank under the help baleful sculpture stale. stare. Stop tearing this ship apart, piece by piece, component by component, and you find those tapes. As for the passengers, if any, I want them alive. He paused a moment, and then added, Quickly! Officers and men nearly fell over themselves in their haste to leave, not necessarily to carry out Vader's orders, but simply to retreat from that malevolent pre presence. R2-D2 fully came, finally came to a halt in an empty corridor, devoid of smoke and the signs of a battle. A worried, confused 3PO pulled up behind him. You've led us through half a ship, and to what? He broke off, start staring in disbelief as the squat robot reached up with one clawed limb and snapped the seal on a lifeboat hatch. Immediately, a red warning light came on in a low hootings sounded in the corridor. 3PO looked wildly in all directions, but the passageway remained empty. When he looked back, R2 was already working his way into the cramped boat pod. It was just large enough to hold several humans, and its design was not laid out to accommodate mechanicals. R2 had some trouble negotiating the awkward little compartment. Hey! A startled 3PO called, admonishing. You're not permitted in there. It's restricted to humans only. We just might be able to convince the Imperials that we're not rebel rebels programmed, and we're too valuable to break up. But if someone sees you in there, we haven't got a chance. Come on out. Somehow, R2 had succeeded in wedging his body into a position in front of the miniature control board. He cocked his body slightly and threw a stream of loud beeps and whistles of, reluctant, of his reluctant companion. Tripio listened. He couldn't frown, but he managed to give a good impression of doing so. Mission? What mission? What are you talking about? You sound like you haven't gotten integrated logic terminal left in your brain. No, no more adventures. I'll take my chances with the Imperials. And I'm not getting in here. An angry electronic twang came from the R2 unit. Don't call me a mindless philosopher, Tripio snapped back. You overweight, unstreamlined glob of grease. Tripio was concocting an additional rejoinder when an explosion blew at the back of the uh, back wall of the corridor. Dust and metal debris whished through the narrow passageway, followed instantly by a series of secondary explosions. Flames began jumping hungrily from the exposed interior, reflecting of 3PO's isolated patches of polished skin. Muttering the electronic equivalent of consigning his soul to the unknown, the lanky robot jumped into the life pod. I'm, I'm, I'm going, going to regret, regret this, it. he muttered more audibly to R2 and he activated the safety door behind him. The smaller robot flipped a series of switches, snapped back a cover, and pressed three buttons in a certain sequence. With the thunder of explosive latches, his life pod ejected from the crippled fighter. I'm going to break here and continue tomorrow with hopefully less technical difficulties. Thank you for listening.